Welcome to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson, your host. Gender identity introduction to minors is a hot topic, one that was dealt with recently by our state legislature when they passed Senate Bill 150. And testifying in one of, one of the legislative committees was Jeanette Cooper, one of the founders of Partners for Ethical Care. She testified on behalf of the bill, which banned in part puberty blockers and surgical intervention for gender dysphoric minors. Jeanette, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I'll say this at the outset. I appreciate you coming to the Commonwealth of Kentucky and testifying on behalf of um, one of the most uh, noteworthy and controversial bills that received national attention last session. And I'm going to start out with this. Um, I was recently on a debate uh, with people in the transgender advocate community who criticized the passage of that bill. Of course, it's to be expected that they'd be opposed to it. They didn't agree with um, the reason and rationale why it was passed. But one of their criticisms, Jeanette, was that why don't you have anybody from Kentucky testifying on behalf of that bill? Now, you and I know the reason for that. Um, but let's let's talk about that further. I mean, uh, people are people are afraid to come out and to um, possibly be a target, aren't they? Yeah. Can I tell you some of the things that people um, said to me as I was entering and leaving the yeah. state house there? Yeah. They said, you're an abuser. Your child will die and it will be your fault. Mm. I hope that you never see your child again. Mm. Um, you deserve what's happening to you. Mm. Um, I hope that you suffer and die in pain. Mm. Um, numerous things they said to me, and they don't even know me. And I'm not probably going to see them again unless I visit Kentucky, which I, I have done recently. Um, these are people who don't know me, don't know anything about me. And luckily, um, I don't live in their neighborhood. But I do have a significant parent group of parents from Kentucky. And no, they don't really want to face that. They don't really want neighbors, people they might see in the grocery store to say such things to them. It's extremely painful. I've gathered a lot of resiliency. So I know that the things that people say to me, they don't actually know anything about me, anything about my family, my daughter, or anything. So I know that what they're saying to me is not personal. It's coming from a deep place of pain. Mm -hmm. And I can withstand that after years of, uh, I guess, therapy and, and figuring out things that I can control and things that I can't and the motivations of people. I will say that it's correct. We didn't have parents um, testify in Kentucky, but I can, I can tell you that the attorney general's office has sworn statements from parents in Kentucky from that group. The attorney general's office has been in contact with us and I've given them the names of parents who absolutely have used their name and have have given testimony to the attorney general's office to defend this bill. They feel quite strongly about it, but no, nobody wants to walk inside of a pretty small room, sit there. You can see pictures of how testimony operates where you sit at a table and there's people just maybe five to seven feet behind you talking loudly enough yeah. that I could hear them, um, but not loudly enough that the chair could hear them. And so they were saying some pretty nasty things um, in my ear while I was trying to listen to what was going on. It's not appropriate, it's not professional, it's not the way that we should do government. Um, yeah. If we're going to do things, let's do them in a transparent manner, not in the hallways, not in whispers. And that's what we try to do during legislation is, is put things out in the open and really talk openly and honestly. Uh, Jeanette, I was behind you when you were at the testimony table and immediately behind me, there were um, two transgender individuals who were being loud, um, loud enough where I could not hear your testimony. And I turned around a couple of times and just gave them the look to let them know that I could hear them. And the third time I turned around, they started to get obnoxious, like turn around and stop looking at us. And I know the chair of that Senate committee. And I looked up ahead to him trying to get eye contact with him. And he was about ready to kick somebody out. He pointed out the wrong person uh, and asked them to move. And then the crowd said, no, it's not that person. And I just wanted to say, Chair Carroll, it's right behind me. And then I thought, I'm not doing anything, but I might get thrown out of this room. <laughs> that was not my intention. But 
to your point, committee hearings should be done with respect and decorum, and there's, there should be a willingness to afford the other side. Both sides have a chance to speak, but it should be done civilly. And that's not what happened um, when you came to testify. I'll add this, I felt threatened. Um, that room was dominated by transgender activists, and it was a tense feeling. Uh, people were not being respectful. At the end of that meeting, there was an outburst. When the committee voted Senate Bill 150 out, there was a loud outburst. And the uh, state police were there, security was there, and they had to get uh, right next to people and help escort them out. Um, that's a, That was unnerving, shouldn't be part of the process. Here's my question to you. Is this something you experience when you testify in front of other state legislators or in legislative committees? Certainly, it happens in every state. Um, I remember the first time that I testified in Ohio for it was then last year's House Bill 454 um, with Gary Click as the sponsor. And that bill's moving along, by the way, um, going to the Senate next, passed out of the House, going to a Senate committee. So if that, the, the protesters that actually positioned themselves outside of the room, outside of the building, next to the windows where the testimony was happening. So you could hear them shouting through the windows from outside, interrupting the testimony. And there's not much you can do, it's public grounds. Right. It's just, it, it makes like, um, I don't know if the chair said it in Kentucky. I know it was happening at another, I think in, in Texas, there was a chair that said, you're not making your side look very good. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening is you can be in distress, um, but maybe the public sphere is, is not the place necessarily to do that. There are processes and we all want them to work properly. And we have to have the, the golden rule of do unto others. You don't want somebody shouting at you and, and saying terrible things to you that have nothing to do with them. I mean, I have compassion for people who are suffering, but we also have a, a system in place that allows respect for everybody. And I think that, that should, that's what should be happening. So yes, it happens in every state. I think the worst thing that I have seen um, ever in any of these testimonies was Texas went on their bill until midnight and then they stopped testimony. It was all day. I think I was in that room for um, going on 14 hours. It was really long. And at the end at midnight, they had a bunch of young people that had obviously been prepared and um, encouraged to participate in what is called a die-in. Hmm. So they had white t-shirts that they had stained with what was supposed to look like blood. These are teenagers and 20 somethings laying on the ground reenacting or enacting some sort of idea of death um, that this will actually kill people that legislation kills people hmm. um, I don't know any legislation that kills people except for death penalty legislation um, and it's hor it's horrifying to think that somebody has encouraged young people to enact their own death that's wrong. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that is the worst thing that I've, I've seen. Now, like I said, I can withstand lots of things. And you were saying that you were uncomfortable um, and felt physically uncomfortable. I, I have a lot of trust in the, I guess, the, the people who are guarding um, the citizens who are inside that room, both me and others. I don't want anybody to get hurt in any way. Um, but the fact is, if, if I got you know punched in the face or, or shoved or pushed, I'm not going to die. And I certainly will have all of my genitals and breasts by the mm. time I leave that room, unlike the children that we are trying to protect. Mm. So I'm not worried about something like that. And I think this is, I mean, this is participatory democracy and, and this is how we do the Republic. So I think it's necessary that we participate and somebody has to hold the line here and somebody has to represent professionalism. And I think that that's something that we have to keep participating in and keep modeling for others to see. Yeah, that's very, very good. And I couldn't agree more, couldn't have said it better. Um, so what prompted you to get involved with this very difficult issue? You've been accused of a number of things. You've been vilified. Um, very hurtful things have been said to you. This is not an easy topic to deal with, highly controversial. Uh, what prompted you to start Partners for Ethical, uh, Ethical Care and to engage this issue? Um, originally, my my daughter um, expressed 
uh, via email that she was transgender after going to her dad's house for a visit. And she never returned from that visit, that three and a half hour visit, um, custodial visit. So I had known that the concept of transgenderism was seeping into society really through radical feminist communities. There were many young women and, and older women who felt like their bodies were some seen as some sort of object. Um, and there's kind of a lot of internalized homophobia, let's say. Uh, and so they had been kind of disengaging with their bodies. Um, and I had watched women identifying as men or not identifying as women in weird, um, unhealthy ways, I thought. So I didn't think a lot about it until my daughter said, hey, mom, I'm trans through this email. Um, and then I, I had asked for return of custody through the family court system. And, and that didn't work like it was supposed to. So there was no, um, there was no investigation by child and family services at all because there was no, there was no abuse or neglect allegation. Um, all it was is, is a child psychologist saying, hey, you know, your, your daughter says that she has gender dysphoria and the current protocol for teaching gender dysphoria or for addressing gender dysphoria is the affirmation model. You affirm a child's transgender identity or gender identity. Um, and the threat is the suicide myth that the child is more likely to kill themselves if not affirmed in this transgender identity. And affirmed could be a social transition of name pronouns that don't match biological sex, um, clothing and, and hairstyles, which I don't even think should be uh, related to anybody's biological sex. Um, and, and then this medicalization, which my daughter never wanted, still doesn't want. So that's how I got into that. Um, I will say that today my daughter would describe herself and is a feminine presenting mm -hmm. young woman. Um, she still uses pronouns that don't match her biological sex. She now has adopted a name for the past four plus years that is a uh, male name in most groups. Um, so it, it's a bit odd to me to watch because she is one of the most feminine young women I've seen much more so than myself. So that's how I got into that. Um, I still have no, no custody and no, I haven't had any communication with her since January of last year. I saw her for an hour and the last letter I received was October of 2021. Um, so Sweet. she's gonna be seven, thank you. She's gonna be 17 in August and she'll grow up and, and things change and we'll see what happens, we don't know. But these these women came together to form partners for ethical care. Me being one of them, it was a it was a handful, maybe a dozen of us, to say what do we want um, to actually do? What do we have the skills for? And we decided to focus on children. Children being more vulnerable than women. I mean, children are so vulnerable; they don't have the ability to make legal decisions. And we've started to create that in some states in a way that I don't think matches children's brain development and gives them responsibilities and power before they have the capacity to make those decisions. So we started to focus really on children and this affirmation model. So our interest is in abolishing the affirmation model, the affirmation of, of a child's gender identity. We don't think that gender identity um, exists. It's a, it's a made up idea and it's harming children both psychologically and physically. So it's an achievable goal we can in fact abolish the affirmation model, both in schools, mental and medical health um, arenas. It, it is achievable, we can do it. And we do hope that it will not become, it will not continue to be the norm. It, what happens when somebody says, I'm a boy is that's not based on objective reality. So we're interested in abolishing that. Jeanette, this has become hyper-politicized where strong emotions have, um, overtaken rational discussion to the point where, as we mentioned, you've been vilified, you've been criticized, you and your organization have been called grifters. Um, there is no middle ground. It's either you have to believe like we do, either totally buy into uh, affirming a child's chosen gender and to use their preferred pronouns. And if you don't agree with that, you hate them, you don't care for them, you seek their demise in some way. Um, and testimony uh, that we've heard has put it this way, 
uh, if you, you have a choice, uh, a binary choice, either you affirm your child's transgender identity, you can either have a live tri transgender child, or you can have a dead, whatever their biological gender is. Um, how do we break through that? Uh, where do we begin? There is no middle ground, uh, just simply having a different view like you have. And you're approaching this from the idea of parental rights, uh, from the idea that children cannot fully um, consent to a medical transition because their brains aren't fully formed. You're coming at it from the uh, position of what's appropriate to be taught in our schools. That's your position. The other side says, no, you're simply hateful. You don't care about them. Tell us maybe some of the ways you've gone about um, winning over those in the middle and in, in advancing your arguments. So there's a couple of things. One, I, I want to address the suicide myth. Um, I just did an interview with Chloe Cole actually at my home around the suicide myth. So for sure, that myth is built upon logical fallacies, one of which, you know, you you pointed out this false dichotomy of a, a living trans son or a dead daughter. Um, that's a false dichotomy. There's always more than one choice. There are numerous logical fallacies within the suicide myth. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, like I say in my testimony, the greatest fear of every parent. So Chloe and I, in an interview recently, well, really a discussion or dialogue, um, broke down all of those things in a very compassionate and curious way, really a conversation that we were having that was recorded. And so she's going to publish that soon. And and that that's a lovely conversation to have with anybody, which is let's break this down because we can't live in a state of anxiety and fear. When we're making decisions in a state of anxiety, they they inherently are not rational. Hmm. One of the things that we did also that weekend, which was a couple of weekends ago, um, we were in Chicago near where the old children's hospital is, or was in, in Chicago. And we were there, Chloe, uh, Prisha Mosley, um, and then another colleague of mine, Donna, um, at Partners for Ethical Care. We stood outside on the corner of DePaul University and, and Lincoln Park and just talked to passers-by. We had questions on boards. Uh, one of them was, what is a detransitioner? Another one was, are puberty blockers reversible? Um, and then I had one that said, uh, what, is, uh, what is the gender industry? And Chloe was holding one um, that said, honk if puberty sucked. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she got, of course, honks from tons of people because it's an awful time. It's absolutely awful. And we used to live kind of intergenerationally and we used to talk to different people and we would all get validated in this idea that, yeah, your feelings um, are, are real. You're really having these feelings that it's, it's uncomfortable in your body. And those feelings used to be validated, but not that there was something wrong with you, but that it was a common coming of age experience that everybody had. And everybody knew that we were having it and somehow that has gotten lost. I'm not sure how. And now there is some industry called the gender industry, which is making money off of your distress. Not that we didn't have an industry that made money off of people's distress before. Of course we did. It's called the beauty industry, yep. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's millions of dollars that women pour into the beauty industry and men also because of, because of mental distress. So somehow, you know, this gender industry has taken advantage of that and, and it used to be normal. Um, so that was a nice conversation around the, the suicide myth and then this idea of the gender industry and how that functions. Um, but it's really truly impacting children in ways that are irreversible. Yeah. It's hard, people say all the time, well, yes, you can just stop these things. So sure, things might be able to be stopped, but you know what's not reversible is time. <laughs> time is not reversible. And we don't know what happens when fully, when you take puberty blockers for such a long period of time. We do know that it stops lots of things, your physical development, which includes your brain. Your brain is part of your body. And we do know that it has an impact on brain development. So that's scary. Let's talk about that further. We're going to take a quick break. If you're just joining us, you're listening to the Commonwealth Matters with Jeanette Cooper of Partners for Ethical Care. We'll take a break and we'll be back in just a moment. 
Welcome back to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson here with Jeanette Cooper of Partners for Ethical Care. And Jeanette, just before the break, we were talking about puberty blockers. Now, one of the arguments that uh, pro-transitioners for children, which that's an awkward term. I, I hate to even use that. There's something more serious um, and egregious going on. But there is the argument that, look, if if a child is gender dysphoric, you can administer these puberty blockers and it's reversible. They If they change their mind or feel comfortable back in their original biological sex, they can pull off of those puberty blockers and everything will be fine. Um, that is one of their strong arguments. It's believed uh, by many. Um, do we have science? Is, is there research that shows no, puberty blockers are not safe and there are negative effects on children who take them? I would love to say that we have lots of research on this topic, but unfortunately, they don't approve studies to do such medical experiments on children. How There's can... a reason that we don't have a lot of data. It's because this is experimental medicine and nobody's calling it what it is. So you would normally have clinical trials and such on this. So sure, puberty blockers, Lupron has been used for precocious puberty in short periods of time, six months maybe maybe a year and they measure things like bone density and they do, you know, they, they measure brain development. But to be honest, we will not know how somebody's brain would have developed. We will never know that because right. that's not ethical to do such an experiment on children. Jeanette, we're told that uh, there are no gender transition centers in Kentucky for minors. However, looked at your website, which, by the way, is a great website, a ton of great resources on the Partners for Ethical Care website. But you have something called the Gender Mapping Project. And on that map, you have gender clinics um, located all across the co uh, country. In Kentucky, it looked like there's at least two, maybe three. One was up near the Cincinnati area, and I couldn't tell if it was in northern Kentucky or in Cincinnati. But you've identified at least two clinics that are doing gender services for minors. Um, tell us about your gender mapping project, if you will. Yeah, the president of our organization, Alex Aaron, is the gender mapper. She's known as the gender mapper because she maps all of these. So in order to do that, she has people call or verify um, that they perform such services. So the things that are listed on there have been verified by individuals who have reported that information to, to Alex. Um, and yeah, she tracks that all over the world. In Kentucky, um, we actually have one of the most, um, uh, the, the greatest group of parents because they have so much information and they have such connections, such great connections inside of, of some of these places, which again, they've shared with the attorney general. Um, so we've recorded a call, one of our parents recorded a call um, calling one of these clinics and asking them what they perform. And so, yeah, that that information is is validated. They have said that they do these things to children. Sure, they do double mastectomies on, on mm -hmm. children, um, which is awful. Uh, so for people to say that those things are not happening, I, th I think we're beyond that. Yeah, It's very clear uh, that they're doing this to children. Now, one of the gender transition centers, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but it's the University of Kentucky. They have a gender program for minors. Um, when that's been brought up in public conversation, that's been denied or deflected. Um, are you finding that the research universities across the country are engaging in this, or is this just a Kentucky anomaly? Well, you know how they do this. They say that we're not doing it. Um, and this was one of the questions, I think, in, in Ohio. Uh, what happens is the universities say, well, we're not performing this. And they were asked in Ohio, well, do you refer patients to doctors who are perform such mm -hmm. surgeries? And, and the person said, well, what do you mean by refer? Mm -hmm. what, what exactly are you saying? It seems there? pretty cut and dry to me. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> refer means refer. Right. You're right. <laughs> right. So they're saying referral, like, do we write a medical referral letter that, you know, that you would use for insurance purposes? And like you were saying, they were evading a very basic question. The answer is yes. They refer to private providers, plastic surgeons who remove the breasts of children. Yeah. Yes, they do. And they know that they do, and they're getting around the question um, on a technicality. 
but they know that they refer out for those things for sure. That's like saying, do you refer people to get testosterone? Yes, it's called a pharmacy. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I do refer people out to get testosterone. Jeanette, we are, we are running out of time. I, I want to share some recent news. It was just revealed the other day that the Jefferson County Public School System had teachers in it that organized a walkout for students. They arranged school buses. Um, they had students come into the school buses and they bused them to the state capitol to protest Senate Bill 150. Um, this open records request that was done revealed that teachers were involved. They coordinated this. They were in touch with students. Um, to politically activate um, students. Hundreds of students showed up on the Capitol. Um, are you seeing a politicization of students? I mean, where they're taken out of the classroom and brought to protest in Capitals? I'm, by the way, shocked at that, alarmed at that. This is not the mission of our public schools. It, again, is this a Kentucky anomaly? Or are you seeing this in other states as well? I have seen young people, and this is quite disturbing actually, when we see young people, particularly testimony. I don't like to see children, um, certainly not minors testifying. They don't have the legal authority to do so, nor do they have the capacity, I think, to understand the ramifications, certainly. I think young people should be involved in understanding how the government works before they are voters at 18. I think it's important for them to understand, but it doesn't make sense to me that you would have students come on one side. That's simply not a reflection of America and our disparate um, and diverse beliefs. So there's no, there's no way that you would even have a classroom of kids who all agree on this. That doesn't make sense. So Clearly, I'm all for people participating in the political process, but let's make it fair. Otherwise, it seems a bit like coercion of children who are very vulnerable and want to be able to do something that is pleasing to their teachers. And they, they don't want to suffer any ramifications in terms of their schooling. It makes sense for them to comply. Yeah, that's good. Jeanette, we have just a minute left. Can you share a word of encouragement to parents who might have a gender dysphoric child or a parent who's concerned about what's going on in their child's classroom? Any words of, of wisdom and encouragement to them? Speak up. Everybody can speak up and say something. I think having conversations with people all the time is, is really good. It doesn't have to be a debate. It really, you can dialogue with anybody. All you need to do is, is plant some seed and recognize that we all have common shared humanity. I, I think that's the most important to think, thing to do is, is to talk to your neighbors and talk to everybody, but come from a place of curiosity and compassion um, when you engage with fellow human beings. And I think we'll all be better as a society in general. What a great word to close on. Jeanette, God bless you. You keep up the good work. And uh, next time you're in Kentucky, give me a call. Let's get together. I, I will. I'll have to get out of my really fancy office here. Um, uh, you know, we have tons of money at Partners for Ethical Care. That's why I have this lovely office called the Jeep. <laughs> good. Thank you. God bless. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Appreciate it.